February 24th, 1976, the Four Seasons' Oh What a Night was a big hit on the radio. Welcome back. Welcome back, Carter, was must-see TV. You talking to me? And Taxi Driver had just premiered at local theaters. You talking to me? Michelle Mitchell was enjoying being a UNR nursing student. This night would be her last. She just was extremely kind. And she would, um, she just was nice to everybody, no matter who they were. And she was really responsible. She always wanted to make sure that she got things done. At around 8 that night, Michelle was on her way to meet her father at a bowling alley near UNR when her yellow VW broke down on Evans Avenue. She crossed the street and called her mom from a phone booth in front of the agricultural building on campus. Her mom was there within 10 minutes, but there was no Michelle. With the second panic call from Michelle's mom to Kathy's house, her best friend started to worry. Mom asked Barbara, that was her mom, if the car door is locked. And Barbara said, no, it's not. And I said, ask her if the tape deck's in the car. And she said, yeah, the tape deck's in the car. And I said, you need to call the police, something's wrong. For nearly two hours, Reno police, Michelle's mom and dad knocked on doors and searched the area. Then at 10.30, an elderly couple opened their weathered garage door and there was Michelle, dead on the dirt floor. What he said at that point was that she had been raped and murdered. And my mom just repeated it out loud, I think because she couldn't wrap her mind around it. And you're, could you wrap your mind around it? No, not at that point. The word spread quickly around campus. At the Pi Phi house, best friends Ann Langer and Morgan Murphy were studying when they received word of trouble down the street. And somebody knocked on the front door, it was the police, and they said that they wanted to let us know that there had been a murder on campus, and of course we were all freaked out and surprised. A, a girl had been killed across the street from the SAE house, and so we all needed just to stay home. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At the SAE house, less than half a block away from the murder, police questioned fraternity brothers. Did anyone see someone suspicious in the area? Had any one of them seen Michelle alive? Did someone in this house know something, anything? Anxiety was at an all-time high here in the Truckee Meadows, and it wasn't just because of the Michelle Mitchell murder case. You see, four days earlier, another woman, Peggy Davis, was found stabbed to death in her apartment here at 2nd and Ralston. Now, the culprits were eventually arrested and prosecuted, and there was never any evidence connecting them with the Michelle Mitchell murder case, which meant Michelle's murderer was out on the loose. One of the gals that worked at the Pi Phi house lived next door to the couple where Michelle was found. Within days, details of Michelle's murder started to come out. She had been missing for an unexplainable two hours. Evidence suggests she had died shortly after she was taken into the garage about 1030. Her hands were bound, her throat slit. At the scene, a burned cigarette. Matches that were lit to illuminate the inside of the garage, presumably to find the twine to tie her hands. There were two sets of footprints in the garage, Michelle's and someone wearing a common man's shoe. All of this information just added to the fear and anxiety around campus. The fraternity boys offered to walk the girls to class in the evening, and it really changed the tone. Everybody became very, very nervous. Oh, th there was so much fear on campus at that point on. The rest of the year was just uh, abject fear. Howard Rosenberg taught a cinema class at night in 1976. The next day, people walking around just completely bewildered that anything like this could happen. But for Michelle's best friend, the experience on campus was quite different. Kathy Milbeck had just lost her best friend. And for about six months, she says, undercover officers followed her around, afraid a serial killer was still at large and she might be the next target. What was worse, the reception she received from fellow students when she got back to class. I think everyone was scared, but I also think nobody knew what to do with me, and so they just avoided me. At 19, Milbeck had lost her best friend. Her parents would fear she would be next. How she carried on is anyone's guess, but carry on she did, just as the rest of the student body would. So I think after living in fear for um, at least that year and probably into my senior year, there's, 
a time in life that you have to decide to be very careful, you know, know what your surroundings are, and live your life the, the best you can. Because if you constantly lived in fear, you wouldn't get much accomplished. So gradually, most of the community stopped looking over its shoulder. Reno police detectives, however, continued their work. It was described as the most intensive investigation in the city's history. It was given a lot of priority. There were a lot of people investigated. There were people that lived in the neighborhood uh, that were sex offenders. Uh, I think there were about six or seven of them in, you know, within 10 block radius that, that were known perverts that could have been involved and they were all investigated. Leads came in but went nowhere. There was no secret witness in those days, but the family raised a reward, still nothing. Then a break. February 24th, 1979, three years to the day of the murder, Reno police received a call from their counterparts in Louisiana. A nurse at a mental hospital there reported that a patient had told her that she'd killed a woman named Michelle in Reno. The patient was Kathy Woods. Woods had been diagnosed as schizophrenic at age 13. In the six months before, she had been hospitalized three times, the last after an attempted suicide. In 1976, Kathy Woods had managed a topless bar here on 2nd Street. Ironically, it was just a block and a half from the one where Peggy Davis, that other murder victim, had worked. She would be tried and convicted twice. The first conviction was thrown out. Lee Hodgkin, then with the Public Defender's Office, was assigned her case in the second trial. He faced an uphill battle. She was schizophrenic and she was uh, soft-spoken and her uh, body movement was, you know, she wasn't expressive. She was, you know, just kind of comatose. So, uh, you know, you had to uh, uh, plan on building a defense without her testifying. And Woods hardly presented a sympathetic figure. A former manager of a topless club, a mannish lesbian at a time when homosexual acts were still a felony in Nevada. Someone who, according to her confession, heard voices telling her to kill. She was portrayed as a monster. Just a deviant monster. But Hodgkin says her defense team was convinced she was innocent. There were problems with the physical evidence. Two sets of footprints going into the garage, Michelle Mitchell's and those of the killer. Just one coming out, and it belonged to a man's loafer, a couple of sizes larger than Woods. Witnesses had seen a man running from the area, and though Woods often dressed in men's clothing, it was questionable if her physique would be mistaken for a man. But her attorneys felt they needed something more. The argument was it wasn't proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but in a, in a case that high profile, some attorneys will tell you, you have to give them an alternative. You can't just say there isn't enough. The prosecution was saying Michelle Mitchell had been killed after laughing off a sexual advance from Woods. Hodgkin and her attorney in their first trial offered a different motive, a different suspect. They tied it to the Peggy Davis murder and suggested Mitchell's real killer was Tony Lima, boyfriend of one of the women convicted in the Davis case. The confession was harder to attack. Woods had given it to a Reno detective in Louisiana. She hadn't been read her rights and it was argued might not have been able to understand them in any case. She got some of the details of the crime right, but some wrong. She also told the detective she'd been working for the FBI. Unfortunately, the confession hadn't been recorded. In fact, the detective didn't sign his report until a day and a half later. The defense tried to keep it out. Both judges allowed it, and the case turned on it. If they didn't have the confession, they had an unsolved murder. And if you go back, they called it the reign of terror back then because people were, were scared. The community didn't want to think that it was an unsolved crime. Hodgkin says five jurors initially voted to acquit, but eventually sided with the majority. Woods was convicted a second time. A motion for a third trial failed. The case had been thoroughly investigated and there were no legal errors on which to base an appeal. The community had every reason to believe that Michelle Mitchell's murderer was safely locked away for the rest of her life. It would take 28 years and a leap in forensic science to shake that belief. In 2010, Kathy Woods was an inmate at the Florence McClure Women's Correctional Center in North Las Vegas. She had been in custody then for 31 years. A fellow inmate filed a motion for her, seeking to have the evidence in her case examined for DNA. 
That evidence had been stored, along with that from other high-profile cases, in a special room beneath the courthouse. Everything was there. Documents, crime scene photos, and physical evidence. Michelle Mitchell's clothing, some of the cords she'd been bound with, and, in an evidence envelope, a cigarette butt found near her foot. There was DNA on it, and it wasn't from Kathy Woods. In fact, it belonged to a man, unidentified, but wanted elsewhere. And that changed everything. There was a serial killer walking the streets of Reno back in February of 1976, but Michelle Mitchell would not be his first victim. Instead, it would happen about a month prior here in Pacifica as an 18-year-old made her way to this bus stop to attend a birthday party. The following day, Veronica Ancasio was found near a spring at this golf course. It's adjacent to the bus stop. She was stabbed to death. There would be more. 14-year-old Tanya Blackwell on January 24th, Paula Baxter on February 4th, Carol Booth March 15th, Denise Lampy April 1st. The murders occurred in Pacifica, Broadmoor, Daly City, and South San Francisco. All were stabbed, sexually assaulted. Bodies dumped and found days to months later. Nowhere are with all five of these girls are we able to match anything of them even knowing each other. So the only thing in common between them is the suspect. As I said, thank you all for coming. At the FBI press conference in San Francisco two months ago, authorities said they were able to link the Michelle Mitchell murder to the other Peninsula cases. Yeah, a light bulb went up in my head and I, uh, I'm going to say terror in the community because really parents, some parents were telling their children news accounts of changing their hairdo because they didn't want their daughters to become victims. Longtime Bay Area reporter Vic Lee was there and says he remembers covering some of these murders, but only slightly. It was a crazy time. There was a zebra killings, racially motivated uh, killings by this extremist black Muslim faction, randomly targeting white uh, victims. There was a Zodiac, this uh, serial killer who used the sign of the Zodiac, sent it to the Chronicle newspaper here every time he killed somebody. Lee says back in 1976, law enforcement agencies didn't typically talk to one another, and the killings may have been perceived as a one-time deal in each community. They had small police forces uh, with the inability to really, um, you know, investigate uh, a murder thoroughly. DNA technology, what was that all about? The pursuit of justice is not always instantaneous. For each of these police agencies, I think it's uh, always important that they conclude a case, put a case to bed, and say, we did it. 38 years ago, many Reno residents will tell you Michelle Mitchell was murdered by a serial killer. In 2014, it's more than just speculation. Law enforcement from the Bay Area are doing an exhaustive investigation. They're looking at witnesses. They're looking at old evidence and trying to find suspects' files. In the meantime, there are people that have an emotional stake in this case, and they're sitting by the sidelines. But they, too, are thirsty for answers. You know, as a family member, you'd like to know without a shadow of a doubt who did it. You know, I just feel like if this new evidence can shed any light on these other poor girls who were murdered, then, you know, it, it's a positive thing. That search for truth is now taking place on two fronts. As the federal task force searches for that unidentified man, the legal system confronts a troubling question. Was justice really done all those years ago, or has a woman spent half her life behind bars for a crime she didn't commit? DNA evidence puts another person in that garage with Michelle Mitchell, a man wanted for a series of murders committed at the same time in the Bay Area, a man not Kathy Woods. It was always my belief, and the belief of many, that uh, there was a second person. There is no physical evidence at all to connect Kathy Woods to that scene or that murder. Absolutely none. But what about that confession? Well, it turns out that fully a quarter of the convictions overturned by DNA in all kinds of cases in recent years have involved false confessions. In homicides, they're the leading cause of wrongful convictions. People, even those without Kathy Woods' history of mental illness, do admit to crimes they didn't commit. 
Investigators in the task force are now tracking down and testing DNA from potential suspects here in California and we know beyond. One of the first was Tony Lima, the suggested alternate suspect in the two trials. He has since died, but a sample from a relative has cleared him. Neither the investigators, nor the prosecution, nor the defense had the advantage of this science 30 years ago. Today, it could eventually lead to identifying the man, alive or dead, who killed those five young women in the Bay Area and who stood and smoked a cigarette at the feet of Michelle Mitchell as she lay dead and bleeding in that garage. And it could free a mentally ill woman who spent 35 years in custody. So nearly four decades after that grisly discovery in an Evans Street garage, after all those years of killing time, justice for Michelle Mitchell, for everyone involved, remains elusive. So if, if this new evidence can help come to a resolution for all of us, I mean, that's what we want.